Hello, hello, hello. My name is Cameron Skinner. I'm the uh, general manager on the Visual Studio Ultimate team. Some say that means I'm the ultimate GM manager. <laughs> that joke never gets old. Yeah. <laughs> like my team's sitting there going, yeah, it does get old. Um, <laughs> we are going to show you a ton of stuff today uh, in the um, Visual Studio V Next, our ALM offerings in particular. Uh, we got a ton of stuff, and I'm hoping that we have some time at the end to take questions and answers. We've got Mike set up here, um, but we may be a little constrained, but we're going we're gonna to do our darndest to try to get through it all. Um, I, here to my right is Mr. Brian Keller. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. That's probably <laughs> fine. He'll be helping me out on all the, all the demos. Um, and so on. You can go to the next slide here. So I, I'm going to show you one, two, maybe three slides total, and then the rest of the time is in, uh, is in, in the product. I hope that doesn't disappoint anybody. Um, ALM, Application Lifecycle Management, we've been in, Microsoft's been in this business for a long time. Uh, 2005, we had our first serious offering in this space. And from that time till now, and for, I, for the foreseeable future, Collaboration is a key piece of what it is that our tooling is enabling. We, we care deeply about how your team members are sharing data, how they're communicating with each other, how they're getting their jobs done together. Uh, it's a key cornerstone and a key design principle that we've got going throughout this. One of the things that makes that important is the, what we call this actionable feedback concept. And the actionable feedback is if I've got some data that's, that's originating over here, let's say on the test side of the house, and that data flows through the system, Team Foundation Server on the back end, for instance, and then a dev picking up that, that defect or that bug can actually do something quickly without a lot of ping-ponging, that's actionable. You saw in the, in the keynote today that you know, Jason started talking about actionable um, incidents from production. We're going to show you that here in a second, but that's another instance of you know, actionable feedback and actionable um, uh, data, essentially. And then, of course, we've got this, this concept of respect uh, your working styles. And basically, this, this is, is um, things from uh, designers working in the system, testers, uh, developers, um, uh, folks working in Eclipse with our Team Explorer Everywhere product, uh, all these sorts of ways. We basically want to have fit for purpose experiences for you to get the most out of the system. And of course, Transparency is key to everything that we're doing inside uh, Visual Studio and Team Foundation Server. We really believe that it's the key to project health. If you understand where your system is at any one point in time, you're able to actually adjust and make the proper um, you know, changes to your, be it your process, code, pro schedule, what have you. Transparency is key, and being able to do that in an agile manner is essential. Okay? So, this slide here, uh, Jason showed this in the keynote, uh, and we spent a lot of time kind of going around this. And we, just do, we do refer to this kind of like the virtuous cycle. This is, you know, you've got the develop, and it goes around, it gets into production, and we do the sprint execution, and it just keeps going, right? And our ALM offering is all about making that as seamless as possible and keeping it going. It never stops, OK? Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to start our conversation today by kind of picking up where Jason left off um, as far as the, the, the incident coming from production, right? And what we showed you in the keynote was a, a SCOM to TFS connector. And uh, at the heart of that was the Avacode technologies that we recently uh, acquired. And there's a fan that's a fantastic technology because it really gives you the quick ability to understand, hey, is this a configuration problem or is it a, a, an app dev problem, right? And there's a number of issues that that could save and save you time and, and get you back up and, and uh, get your mean time to resolution, just nail your SLA, et cetera, et cetera. But there are going to be times when you don't have uh, the, the enough information. And that's when you're going to reach for something that we call IntelliTrace in production. Anyone, uh, anyone uh, heard of IntelliTrace? Yeah, you can <laughs> applaud whenever you want to, by the way. Um, IntelliTrace in production. Let me just give you a quick preamble on what this is. It's our historical debugging feature. You think of it as like a, a VCR for, for debugging information. And, we, and in, in the next, we're going to make that available for production servers. And in fact, 
We're going to make the, the collectors behind the IntelliTrace um, feature actually widely and freely available. You can, you can distribute those freely, get those collectors wherever you need to get them in production, pre-production, wherever you need to be, and then analyze the results of that production in Visual Studio Ultimate. Okay? And so with that, I'd love to just kind of show you what that looks like. What do you think, Brian? That sounds great. So over here I have uh, an application that uh, we were showing you in the keynote. And as you saw, Jason uh, found a bug for us, which we don't want that to happen. But the reality is that let's assume this is running in our production environment. How are we going to get the diagnostics that we need? And you saw some great ways that Victor used some tools to get that AVI code information back into Visual Studio. But sometimes that's not enough. So when we want to really crank this thing up to 11 and get everything that uh, will help us really go back and forth through the call stack, that's what IntelliTrace is for. So until now, you haven't really been able to use IntelliTrace in production. What we'll be doing in the next release is making sure that you can do just that. So what I have here, what I have somewhere, is a cab file. So I've expanded this cab file. That means you can put it on a USB key and take it over to the server that you need to collect IntelliTrace information from. Or you can take advantage of remote PowerShell, do this from your desk, and enable IntelliTrace on the production server sitting in your data center. Uh, so what I'll do here is I'll just go ahead and import my module here. Looks like you're making heavy use of the PowerShell there. Absolutely. I love PowerShell. Anyone using PowerShell? Quite a few. So I can just list all my commands on here. And so you can see that what I can do is start this IntelliTrace collection. And we can actually bind that against your application pool. So I have an app pool here. So we'll start IntelliTrace against Fabricam Fiber. And we'll give it the log file directory we want to spit that into. The other thing I have to pass it is my collection plan. So if you've used IntelliTrace, you know that you can have the option of of just collecting event information, or you can really crank that thing up to cap capture in even your uh, variables that are being passed in and out of methods. So we want to capture all the information we can here. So I'm going to put this onto a trace setting. And now this is going to capture all of the information against that, that uh, particular application pool. So I'll restart my application. What it's doing is it's actually reauthoring the MSIL behind the scenes for me. So we're getting all that trace information collected right into these files. And you'll see that this file is starting to uh, spin up with some information. You do pay a perf hit the first time you hit this, just because we are rewriting all that MSIL. But momentarily, I'll be able to start interacting with the application and then reproduce the issue. So I think this is the repro. I think this is the information that I need. Now I have a, a couple of options at this point. I could either stop collection altogether, mm -hmm. or I can just checkpoint from here, grab a file that represents everything we've done to date, and then keep the IntelliTrace running after that. So let's do that. We'll go ahead and, and checkpoint the IntelliTrace. So this is essentially taking a snapshot of the file that's being collected at this point. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And now if I look at my log directory, there's my second file. Double click to open that in Visual Studio Ultimate. So if you've used IntelliTrace, this should look familiar. There's all my threads up at the top. There's a few things that we're starting to add in the next release. So you can see here that we're actually getting the web request time. So that's really nice. Previously, you would have only gotten that with uh, web performance tests or load tests. We're starting to bring in more of that information, just so you have everything at your fingertips to start understanding and diagnosing this issue. The other thing you'll notice down here is that uh, we have a few null reference exceptions. So I'm going to drill into that. We'll start debugging this issue. And then you'll see all my IntelliTrace events over on the right-hand side. So just, just to set the stage here, who, who has used IntelliTrace before? Just a few, yeah. <laughs> the folks that have used it, oh, yeah, woo! Um, <laughs> here's the thing. We're not running this, this app right now, right? We've got this IntelliTrace log, this iTrace file that we've pulled in, and it looks, Visual Studio, it looks as if it is, it is debugging. This is why we call this an historical debugger. The app actually isn't running, but Visual Studio looks like you're debugging that app as if it was. Exactly. It's like a VCR for your code. And for those of you that are too young to know what a VCR is, you can ask your neighbor. <laughs> so here you see all of my uh, ASP.NET Git events. So that's really cool. Another thing that uh, I can get here is ADO.NET. So this is actually giving me my entire statement that's going up to SQL Server. So that's nice to have. But the root cause I'm looking for is actually these exceptions that are being thrown and caught. So 
one of the nice things about ASP.NET and WPF and some of these other frameworks is they catch a lot of exceptions for you behind the scenes so that your users can keep running the app and it doesn't blow up on them. But the problem, of course, is that we never get the information to say, hey, this is exactly where the problem occurred. With IntelliTrace, we can go back in time and we can see exactly what happened there. So you can see here that by clicking on this, it actually took me straight to the method of code that was executing. And uh, I just need to come in here and do something like, uh, you know, if this is set to null. Then we'll say that should be set to unassigned. And if not, then that's set to some value. Yep. OK, so that's our fix. That's great. That's great, Brian. So that's IntelliTrace in production. And the collector piece, the part that, that Brian showed you is the, the PowerShell side of that. That collector side of IntelliTrace is freely distributable. We want to get that everywhere so you can start to use that in your applications and gather that information when you need to, right? And then pull it back into Visual Studio, that iTrace file, take a snapshot of that thing, and pull it back into Visual Studio and debug, just like you saw in, uh, with, that Brian just showed you there. OK, great. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and get back to the top of the cycle here where we are dealing with your product backlog, OK? Who all's, uh, just show of hands, anybody doing Scrum in the, in the room? Scrum, excellent. Uh, XP, any other agile process? What was that? Kanban. Kanban, good, good, OK, that's perfect. And everyone else is doing waterfall? That's fine, it's totally fine. The systems will help you with that as well. Um, and it will help you with it in an agile way. Uh, OK, so what we've got here is, I showed you this on, on stage. Uh, we've got a new uh, dashboard for Team Foundation Server uh, that we're pretty excited about, actually. Uh, you've got the ability to get in here. The web access portal to Team Foundation Server has always been very rich, and we're just extending it and making it just that much more rich to help you with uh, many of these tasks, that some of which you saw me do on the keynote. We're going to drill into a little bit of it now. But we're going to get in there and show you how to manipulate your backlog, how to understand capacity of your team better, um, how to break down and decompose your stories, and show you a few more details than we weren't able to show in the keynote because we're constrained for time. Let's do that now, Brian. OK, sounds good. So let's jump straight into that storyboarding tool. We quickly showed how Cameron was able to mock up a user interface, show it to Jason, and get some feedback. We didn't have a lot of time to go into some of the additional tools that the storyboarding assistant will show you. Uh, now, I want to stress that everything you see here in terms of a, a mock-up for our existing website, we created it in about 15 minutes. So we want to make it really easy for you to just throw these things together. You can see that I've modeled some custom animations here so we can show how you would work through this, uh, this application, create new records, go from tab to tab. So it's really quick. It's easy to have a conversation. Yeah. You can throw this up on a, on, a, on a projector, or you can email this to somebody. Everyone's got PowerPoint, right? So it's really easy to work with this stuff. Um, Another thing that you can do is you can come in here and you can start taking advantage of custom shapes. So earlier, Cameron gave me some custom shapes. So I can just import these. And he gave me some uh, rating controls. So we want to make it really easy for you to create these custom shapes and share those with the rest of your team. Another thing I might want to do is create my own custom shapes. So that's easy enough. We can just take these guys and say, add shape. And what's a label box? A label plus a text box. That would be a label box, right? Sounds good. All right, so we'll now take this label box and drag it out, and then we can just edit that. So you'll notice these are all rich controls. I've got a really rich control library over here, and we're going to continue to expand this over time so that you have the controls that represent the types of applications you're building. The one other thing I'll show you in here is that we have multiple layouts, so we're taking advantage of master pages. So if I create a new layout here, I can say, actually, that's not my default Fabricam site. Uh, this is actually a SharePoint site. And so I can come in here and edit the URL and say, this is Fabricam.com. So lots of really nice stuff in here. I can also do things like take screenshots. So if you have an existing website you want to grab the masthead from, grab that screenshot, put it on all of your existing layouts. It makes it really easy to work with that stuff. That's great. One other thing I would like to point out, though, is that in the shape library, you can imagine you're going to get a lot of shapes. And so we've given you the ability. We've got a, a lot of shapes and with a lot of tags associated with them. So you saw me in the keynote type map. 
and, and we hit uh, you know, a number of map icons. You just type phone or something like that, you'll get phone icons and backgrounds and things of that nature. So it's really designed to support you in, as you build up, build up these templates. Absolutely. Yeah, this is a cool one. Great. OK, so you know what? Now let's, let's show the, the dashboard. This is the dashboard that I was alluding to earlier. <laughs> which, which you jumped into the storyboard, which is perfect. Um, this is the TFS dashboard that I was talking about earlier. And this is where you'll, you saw me jump into this and get into the backlog work and the task boards. So now let's drill into this, because this is, this is really exciting. Absolutely. So those of you that use Team Foundation Server today, you know that we already have a web access portal. That gives the other stakeholders on your teams who, who may not have Visual Studio a really easy way to interact with the rest of the team. So I can jump in and check out my work items, for example. I can even look at source control and I can see that there have been some check-ins over here. We can even check out builds. We can even queue a new build from the web interface. But what I want to show you here is a, just a, a double-click drill down into some of the areas to support Agile development that we've added in this release. Uh, so if we look at our backlog here, we want to make it really easy for you to quickly manage this and add new items. So I can come down here and say, you know, customer needs to know when tech arrives, I just press enter, I'm ready to start something else, so need to build something cool, and so on and so forth, right? And then as I get these in here, it makes it really easy to actually drag and drop these around. Those of you that use TFS today, if you want to move something around, you have to change it, this value to a 1 and this value to a 5, and it gets kind of messy. But we want to make it really easy for you to quickly manage that backlog and take the input from your customer into account as you're reprioritizing what you're going to build. Not that we want you to constantly be resetting your sprints, as a gentleman over here pointed out. Um, you know, this is one of these things where you, you want to do commits to your sprints, and you want to get see that sprint all the way through, and then start manipulating your priority. But you know, it does happen, uh, and the tools can, can uh, adjust at those sprint boundaries, uh, and they can do it during the sprint as well. But hopefully you're not doing that too much. Absolutely. And so the next thing I can do is I can start assigning these to sprints. So I can say this is work we're going to do in a future sprint. Just drag it over there. You'll notice on the right-hand side that uh, it's now assigned that to a sprint. Up here I have my velocity chart. So this is pulling in data from historical iterations. So this shows what I was able to deliver in past iterations. And then 41 is the number of story points that I've committed to for this particular iteration. And this is all real time. So it's not waiting, it's not pulling from the TFS data warehouse. This is running on the data um, as it's changing. That's right. So if we go back to our scenario where Jason asked you to deliver this yesterday, yep. you need to add this to an existing sprint. So this is a mid-flight sprint we'll add it to. Of course, we need to break into this sprint, decompose this work, and understand exactly what it's going to consist of. So I'll just go ahead and break this down into a couple of tasks. And we want to make sure Lori takes a look at this as well. Great. Oops. And now, of course, I've overburned my team, so we want to make sure that we take some of that work off. And uh, we can scroll down and find this other story that hasn't yet started drag and drop, and then of course everything is updating in real time here, which is really nice. Now you saw that's one way of doing it. Now another way of doing it is we can actually go manipulate capacity if, if folks need to take a vacation or what have you, and we didn't show you this yet. That's right. So I can drop into capacity here, and I know Cameron's been working really hard with this keynote, so we want to make sure we give him a couple days off, and I just type two in there and it automatically updates. So you can quickly come in here, I'm not committing anything, I'm just quickly making those changes, and you can see he's taking a lot of time off. So. Uh, We'll go ahead and give you a couple days. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. And so now that we've got the sprint the way we want it, we now want to switch over to our task board. Yes. Show you a couple of cool things there that we didn't show you in the, uh, in the keynote. So of course, we, we have the ability to take this work and drag this over. One of the things we can do is now collapse that story now that we're done with that particular story. We know that Lori's going to work on this now. And I need to fix my server clock. Bear <laughs> with me. Let's say it's tomorrow. There we go. Great. The other thing we support is uh, workflow rules. So as I come down here, if I move 
Deanna's work accidentally over into this column and say, actually, wait a minute, we need to move that back. Well, we, because we've already zeroed out the, the effort associated with that, it's now giving us a validation error, which is correct. That's what we've told Team Foundation Server to respect. So what we can do is just drop back into there and say, actually, you know what, we still have one hour remaining. The other really cool thing that, uh, that we've done is we've, we've created a, a nice way for you to do your stand-ups. So let's say that Cameron and I are having our stand-ups, and Cameron now wants to say, here's what I did yesterday, here's what I'm working on today. You can now pivot onto Cameron, and now you can see all the work that's highlighted, that's currently assigned to him, stuff he did yesterday, stuff he's working on today. So I can switch over to me, and then I'll change as well. The other thing is, since it, you're going on vacation, I want to take some of the work off of your plate. Please so, do. So I can just... Uh, drag some of that work onto my plate, and if you notice there, it automatically updated the assignment. So that's now assigned to me. You Excellent. can go on vacation. You might want to pull a couple more of those. That'd be fine. <laughs> Sounds that's good. Great. All right. So the idea here, right, is just make the tooling seamless. Don't spend any time, you know, updating these, these, these uh, individual numbers, et cetera. The, let the tool help you with that whenever it can. Um, give you a real, just clean experience. And, and this is all in the web. So, you know, if you've got a geographically dispersed uh, team, they're all looking at the same, same data because they're all pointing at that team foundation server. Okay. The other thing to point out is we are using the Scrum process template here, but this will work with any process template that you use. So we want to definitely respect that. If you're using MSF Agile, MSF CMMI, some third party or custom process template, all these tools will just work. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So what we've got here is you've got all this rich capability to manage those, those priority backlog items. You can break it down, uh, add the tasks that make up those stories, start assigning those to your individual members uh, and, and start dealing with capacity and things of this nature. But at this point, we want to go into the actual dev experience of where the sprint executions start to happen right here in the, in the virtuous cycle. And there's a number of new capabilities uh, that, that we have in Visual Studio, the next, that we, we want to show you today. Um, some of which you, we showed you uh, in the keynote, and we're going to show you a little bit of that again here. Uh, but then we're going to get into a number of other items. Let's do that now, Brian. OK. Um, let's get into my work and, and et cetera. OK, so as Cameron showed, you know, you're, you're in the middle of something, and your boss comes to you and says, I need you to work on something else pronto. But you've got breakpoints set, you've got files open, you've got watch windows, you've got all sorts of stuff. If I had multiple monitors to show you, I could have different tool windows on different screens. And so uh, context switching can be very difficult. So let me ask you something. In an eight-hour day, how many focused, if you're a developer, how much focused time do you have developing? Rough number. Four. I see two over here. Four, two, three. three. Yikes. So you're constantly getting interrupted, is that right? Constantly. And so we, this is one of the biggest things that we've got as we've gone and talked to a ton of feature uh, focus groups. We've talked to you guys. You know, a common complaint is, hey, I just can't stay focused enough. My boss won't stay out of my office. You know, whatever it is, you keep getting interrupted. So we wanted to give you some capability here. And this is a major uh, investment area for us to so help solve that problem. So you see I have these files open. I have some breakpoints. What I can do is just select that and click on Suspend. It's now going to push everything up to a shelf set, which is if you use Team Foundation Server, you know that this is now backing it up on the server. So if I lose this laptop, everything's now saved, not a problem. And now I'll jump over and I'll do something else here. Maybe I'll just add a comment, call it foo. Save that, close out some of these files. You're going to check that in now? Yeah, let's go ahead and check this yep. in. You, know, it's, you, you were asking me to make this change. I know it's a high-priority comment you wanted me to leave. So uh, now that we're done with that, Cameron's happy. I can now switch back to the real work, what I was working on earlier, just by saying resume. And now it's going to take this back off the server. It's going to rehydrate my breakpoints. It's going to reopen those files I had. Uh, it's pulling that shelf set and putting it back on my workspace. That's great. That's really good. So the, you know, again, get you back to where you were as quickly as possible and hopefully get you back into the zone. There's still that disconnect as you're kind of you know, paging back in that, that, that information that you had uh, in, in immediate memory. But I think this will help a lot. It'll also help if you do have multiple monitors, um, you know, we'll replace all the tool windows and things like that. So that, this should really help a lot. One thing that I, I, I would like to point out here, and you, you jump to it for a second, um, if you can go to the home page there, 
This is what we're calling the hub. And one of the things that we're, we're really focusing on in VNext is a focus on developer productivity. And part of that developer productivity is really getting down to what is it that you need to do now and try to take all the other information overload kind of situation out of the mix. So try to you know, really focus on, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my work tasks, you get into the my work pane and you can start focusing on active tasks, past work that you need to do, et cetera. You jump into work items and you can stay, take a broader look at work items maybe assigned to your team or et cetera. But you can just come, come to the home page um, right here in Visual Studio and look at this from like a hub kind of perspective. Does that make sense? And so from there, you go into my work um, and you can get in, into uh, those sorts of things. So one of the things that I would like to, like to um, introduce here actually You've got this my work. A lot of times you're coming in here and you need to fix a bug, you know, what have you, new feature, et cetera. A lot of times what you're trying to do is as you're fixing your system, you're trying to make it better as you move through the code. So, you know, a, a common practice is refactoring. Um, as we all know, make a change, try not to create, you know, duplicate code, et cetera, um, refactor this stuff, get, make the code clean. We've got this uh, phenomenon in this, in this industry where, you know, code just starts to go bad over time, it starts to stink, right? It's kind of just entropies. And a lot of that is we're just not focused enough on, you know, cleanliness as we make changes. So one of the things that we wanted to do in vNext was give you the ability to detect where the most used um, code reuse mechanism in the world. Anybody have an idea of what that reuse mechanism is? Copy and paste. So yes, copy and paste. So one of the things that we wanted to do is, where else, give you, an, give you a, a way to analyze your base to understand how well you're utilizing that particular reuse mechanism, that's one thing. But more importantly, get in there and understand how, what, what sections of your code could potentially be refactored. It's beyond just a simple exact match, and we're going to get into that now. If you can show code, code clone. I'd love to. So here's code clone. I'm going to run it against my entire solution, and what it's doing is it's looking for semantically similar or identical blocks of code. And you can see here that we have one match that came up, and if we take a look at the two of these, if I just flip back and forth, spot the difference, it's pretty much exactly the same. The only difference down here is the redirect. So this is a clear example where somebody took a block of code, they pasted it into another project, and they're reusing that. All they did is change one line of code. Perfect example where we'd want to exactly. refactor that. Yep. Another good example here, if I drill into my extranet project, Search for that. So this is so he just showed you one common use. Like where else? What are some refactoring opportunities? What he's going to go show you right now is a lot of times you, you get into a situation where you're fixing a bug and and you've got this nagging feeling that you've seen code very similar to this somewhere else in your system, but you just you don't know where and you, you're not sure exactly how. So you can select a chunk of code and say, hey, can you analyze this and look for a similar piece of code throughout my system, which is what he's doing now. That's right. So I know I've seen this pattern before. It's, it's shown up a few times as, as I've been doing my code reviews. And uh, here you can see that I have some exact matches, some strong matches, and some medium matches. So we're using some really interesting uh, technology from Microsoft Research here to run some semantic heuristics against this and try and find things that even if the code isn't identical, it's at least similar enough that it's worth inspection. So here you can see I have some medium matches down here. If I open up a couple of these, you'll notice that even though they're similar, they're actually using different entities. So we have a customer repository and a service ticket repository. And so there's a couple of ways you might use this. One is, hey, I'm fixing a bug here. Where yep. might I also look to fix this bug? Or another example is, hey, I know that I, I need to do something like delete and save this customer. What's the pattern that Cameron used the last time he did this? Is there any gotcha? Do I need to wrap this in a try catch? And so I can search for that block elsewhere, and that can help inform the decisions I make. That's great. Yep, that's great. And the thing is, this is not doing a, you know, a regular expression search or what have you. It's not looking for exact matches. It, it does bring in like, the semantic understanding of the code itself. So in this case, it's understanding that you've got two different types, but the pattern looks the same. It goes all the way through all the parameters as well. You've got different, it'll, it'll detect a chunk of code that is similar, but you're passing different parameter values, let's say string values or what have you. That'll also hit. Okay? That's right. Okay. Any, is that an interesting feature you think would you'd use that one 
Yeah? Okay. Excellent. That's excellent. Okay. Okay. Now, a lot of times when you're making these changes, right, you, you need to uh, establish some unit tests and get some unit tests in place uh, in order to make sure that you haven't broken anything uh, too badly. You want to make sure you're testing everything that you're doing uh, so that you can uh, move forward and feel comfortable with those change. We've done a lot in the unit testing um, uh, space uh, in vNext. So we've done, uh, basically what, we've, what we have done is we have taken our unit testing frameworks and we've said we need to open this up and make this easier for folks to use other uh, unit testing frameworks like NUnit, um, you know, XUnit, uh, MS Test, what have you, and just seamlessly integrate that into the product, okay? Um, you, anybody using unit testing tools? Yeah? Okay. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of work that we've done here, and I'd love to show, show this at this point, Brian. That's great. Let's do it. Absolutely. So when I ran a build here, it actually looked across my solution for not only MS test unit tests, but we have unit test adapters to support in unit, X unit. We'll have a new unit testing framework to support native code. So you can write, you can write your tests in native code, and you can run your tests against native code. And so it's really extensible. We can continue to expand on that over time. Peter Provost is here. If you'd like to talk to him after the session, he's the guy in charge of the brains behind making all this, ha this happen. And what you can see here is that I've, I've discovered a few tests within my project or within my solution. I can quickly run these tests. And it's just jitting the test engine right now. So the next time it's going to be much, much faster. We want to make sure that you can do your red, green refactor very, very quickly. Now you can see that this is running quickly at 600 milliseconds. And uh, what you can see here is I have a few tests that passed, a few that failed. I can jump to this one, for example. And you can see that this is an in-unit test. We're using in-unit's built-in uh, mocking framework, so that's really nice. We're able to take advantage of that right within the tool set. Here I have a test that's failing. If I open this one up, it's failing because I commented this out to actually break it so you would see what happens when we fail a test. Down here, you get a stack trace. So here you can see that I'm getting a null exception when we run this particular test. And this actually occurs in two places. So if I jump straight to that, straight to that line within my application that's throwing the exception, you can now get a really quick sense of, OK, I run this test, and now I get this exception. So here you can see that because we have actually haven't mocked up this particular component, we can do that now just by commenting that out. And then that should make it So you pass. just jumped right there from the uh, stack trace. That's cool. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So now I can just rebuild the solution, yep. run it again, that should pass. Mm -hmm. There we go. Excellent. So we've got the timings of each of the, of the tests in there. We've got the summary pane that can pull up and, and jump in. That's great. So the, the, this experience that you're seeing will be the same experience for whatever framework that you decide to use. So we're going to have a, a C++ unit testing framework, um, N unit, X unit, whatever. The, the experience is all the same um, with, with the tooling. That's right. OK. So um, with that, you know, there's another. How many folks uh, are using Team Foundation Server? Yeah? Have you tried searching for work items inside Visual Studio? Yeah, you've tried. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to point out a, a search bar that's inside Visual Studio. Can you search for a work item for me? I sure can. Let's search for Canadian. Do we have any Canadians out there? <laughs> All right. <laughs> the only awesome. one. So we, uh, we had a bug related to, ca to Canadian customer addresses not showing up. I quickly searched for that. Uh, you can see I, I can even come in here and scope this so I can say search for any you know, Canadian customers, work item type equals bug, and I can scope this and quickly find what I'm looking for. So that's very, very cool. Yeah. So any work item type, you can jump right inside Visual Studio. So that, that's a nice little bonus there. OK, so you were working on this, uh, this, this, this bug about Canadian addresses. That's right. right. Yeah, so we've, we've just expanded into new markets, and we need to make sure that we support our Canadian friends to the north. Okay. So I'm going to take this bug off your plate, because you're clearly not getting it done. <laughs> OK. And so I'll switch back over to my work and just signal that I'm working on this guy, drag it up to my work, Okay. drop into my solution. And uh, you know, I think I've, I've figured out the problem here. Our regular expression is actually not taking, it's not considerate of our Canadian addresses. So we just need to change this guy here. Well, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that's right. But yeah. I'd, I'd really love to, to have you take a look at this, Cameron. So now what I'd like to show you is our new code review tool. So if I switch over to Team Navigator, I can say Request Review. 
and I can ask Cameron, does this look right, eh? Is that right? <laughs> and I can say who I want to, to work on this. We'll get Cameron, and uh, I know Lori's a big hockey fan, so we'll have her take a look at that too, and we'll go ahead and submit that request. So now I've created a shelf set, I've pushed that up to Team Foundation server, and we're now taking advantage of the new built-in uh, uh, code review workflow so that now when Cameron switches over, he should be able to see this and give me some feedback. Okay, great. So I'm going to walk in and I basically say, okay, uh, I'm going go to go to my work. And I'm going to look at uh, some, uh, here's an under review. And so what I'll, I'll just do there is I'll just double click on that. And at this point, I'll see, hey, here's the code review. I'll accept it because I'm going to actually do the review. So I'll accept this one. And at this point, uh, you know, I, I see a couple, couple comments. Uh, you know, does this look right? Hey, if, I, if I start clicking around here, um, I, mean, I can reply. I can say, uh, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, if I go down a little bit farther, I can see an a the actual uh, address.cs file that he has changed. Now, a couple things to point out at this point. Um, what you're seeing is a new uh, diff mechanism in Visual Studio. And you'll see that it's an inline diff mechanism. And so you'll see here's the, the old code it is in red. I hope everyone can see that. And uh, the new code is, is yellow. Now, I can, I can switch. And I can say, hey, I want to see this actually in side-by-side -side mode uh, or, or, you know, keep it in line, okay? And that's, that's new in vNext. And I, now I can come in and I can, and I can make comment level, I can comment on the file itself. And so, uh, you know, associate or attribute this file with a general comment, like, you know, uh, you know address, uh, class looks good, you know, something of that nature. But I can also go in and I can say, hey, you know what? Um, this piece of the regular expression is just, just clearly wrong. Uh, so I'm going to add a comment to that. And I'm going to say, uh, I have no idea if this is cool or not. OK? Um, however, what I do know is, since, it's, since we're trying to make this a little bit better, uh, you know, uh, an international kind of code base, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to select zip. And I can, I can add a, a comment to that and say, hey, um, let's make this Postal code. Okay? Like that. Now, what I want to do is I want to send all my comments. I'm essentially publishing my comments uh, to the server, and I'm going to push that through. Okay? And I'm, I'm done with my review. I've done it. Um, and um, oh, one last thing I almost forgot. I wanted, I wanted to point you out to, to this little thing. Notice this little tab up here? Everyone see that? Uh, this is what we call the provisional tab. And this is a, a new uh, U, UI feature in Visual Studio vNext. And the idea behind this tab is to, to um, help you with the doc well clutter that sometimes you get. When you're opening a lot of files, you'll end up with a lot of files open in the doc well. The provisional tab is designed to always recycle. So you're if you're opening up a lot of files, like in this case, I'm opening up many files to review, it'll just show up in that provisional tab so that if I opened up, you know, 20 files or what have you, I can easily just hit that one tab and they're all gone. So it just recycles there. A real common scenario um, where this is going to really, really make your life easier is the debug scenario. How many folks have been, you know, stepping through code and you're stepping through and stepping through and you're looking for a problem and you come out the other side and you've got, you know, 100 files in your doc well, right, that you then need to go close up. That is no longer a problem because what will happen is you'll go step, 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 and it'll go into the, and go into the provisional tab. Now, if you do see a, a file that you want to pin and put into the doc well, you can promote it. So you can click this little button here, which promotes that and puts it in the doc well. Okay? So a couple real, you know, again, I, I started talking about the, the provisional, uh, I'm sorry, the work hub as a way to just really focus on your work, and this is one of those nice little benefits here. So at that point, great, thank you. At that point now, I, I'm going to finish this review and hand it back to Brian so he can actually go make those changes. Okay, thanks, Cameron. So now I'm going to switch back to my workstation here. And uh, if I just refresh my work here. I can take a look at that code review. You can see that Cameron's reviewed it. Lori, uh, sorry. 
you're too slow, so she's not going to get a chance to review this one. So I like these changes. I can jump down here, same kind of thing. I can jump right into the file. It opens that up in my provisional tab well. I can see Cameron's comments. Uh, you know what, man? I, I looked at this regex. I know it's correct, so I'm going to take that. We'll, 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 uh, we'll change zip to postal code in another release. We'll, we'll queue that up later That's on. Right. So I'll go ahead and for now, we want to make sure that uh, we support these Canadian customers. And so we will check that in. That'll resolve my work item, and we're good to go. That's great. Thanks, Brian. So what you see there, code review built into Visual Studio, tightly coupled with the Team Foundation server on the back end, so you can share your files, share your change sets, et cetera, and do those reviews. You can do those pre-check-in or after check-in, however you'd like to do it, whatever works for, uh, for you folks. So now, what we, if we go back to, the, um, to the, the virtuous cycle here, We've spent a lot of time talking about um, feedback, actionable feedback, um, actionable data. Um, what does that look like when you have a continuous uh, feedback mechanism either with your, your team itself, which is uh, highly valuable, but also with your stakeholders, folks who are uh, paying you to make these changes, folks who are asking for uh, you know, whatever changes you've got coming. Uh, Having a tight, virtuous cycle with those folks to make sure you're building the right thing is also a key principle in what we've been doing in Visual Studio v Next. So what we've done is we've created an, a, a, a couple tools. Uh, one tool that we're going to show you today, uh, which is the stakeholder feedback tool. And then in Brian's session uh, later on this week, he's going to show the exploratory testing tool. But today, let's, let's focus on the customer feedback tool, Brian. All right. So we showed this momentarily in Jason's session, but uh, I just wanted to show you this again because it really is nice for you to be able to get feedback from the stakeholders on your team that's, that's, that's not only timely, but it's also actionable. And as Cameron mentioned, being actionable means that you're not just getting a one-line description that says, hey, you know, you need to go take a look at this thing, but it's also including things like screenshots and video recordings. So that's what the stakeholder feedback tool can do. You can include those screenshots, video recordings, audio annotations, so that as Jason or as our business analysts are going through and testing those incremental pieces of software deli we're delivering to them, we can get all that information we need to really understand the feedback as opposed to having to go back and forth over email all the time. So at this point, I'm going to just start collecting my feedback. From this point forward, anything that I do in terms of interacting with my applications is going to be captured as part of a log file. So if I now drop over to my application and I start interacting with it, as you saw Jason, you know, he came in here and he said, this looks good. And then he did something like this where he took a screenshot. So it makes it really easy to include all this information in line. Is the Latin going to get changed? <laughs> and so as I'm going in here, again, there's our bug. We'll go ahead and create that bug. And what you'll see here in a moment is that uh, it already captured everything I was doing. So you can see here that I clicked the desktop, I clicked on the web page, I clicked on a particular ticket. That's where I encountered this particular piece of feedback. And then I, I, I captured the screenshot there, and I captured the custom control. And then once I capture that bug, I then get the option of saying, change these steps, and scoping that to the information that I think is actually really what caused the bug at that point. So now I can save this off. And as you saw Cameron do earlier, we can create a test case from that and make sure we capture that as part of our formal test plan moving forward so that we don't get embarrassed when our VP finds that issue. Yeah. So a number of things going on here that I do want to drill into just a little bit. With the action recording, so we're actually, we are recording all the clicks that are happening, and you see this uh, actions log there that, uh, that we've automatically linked into, the, um, into the, um, uh, the bug or the feedback session here. We're also recording audio and video. And a lot of times, um, I do this with my team all the time at Microsoft, where I have uh, one of my testers come in, and I'll be testing a piece of the, of the code. I'm just going through it as a user would. And I'm sitting there just talking. You know, talking to my tester and saying, hey, I, I don't know, I don't like the way this feels. You know, what about this thing here? And let's move this and let's make these changes. Let's make this bug gets, gets uh, you know, recorded and that kind of thing. I call this feature my, my um, Matt Cosner in a box feature, <laughs> um, where you can turn on the audio recording and the video recording, and you can just have a conversation with yourself, essentially, uh, and start going through the feedback, and it's just recording that audio and video. And then once you hit that submit, the save and close, it associates that with that essentially work item, pushes it into the foundation, Team Foundation server, 
and away you go. And Matt Costner is your is your test lead. Yes. So yes, that's exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and once what what happens then on the other side, the the you know your product owner or who, who or, or what have you goes in there to Team Foundation Server, pulls that feedback out, and starts to analyze that, and starts to break that down into new potentially new requests. Right, that, that wants to send to, the, uh, send to the engineering team. It starts to break this thing down, and then the virtuous cycle starts to kick up again, where we have to go manage our backlog, manage our, our, sprint, our sprint, and so forth. And we had a great story yesterday, actually. Peter got a bug, because we're using this internally now. And uh, he got a bug from a tester that said, hey, if I go into one of the tool windows in Visual Studio, and I grab it like this, and I start going like this, then it eventually crashes Visual Studio. And that's great to have that video. I mean, imagine trying to type that up into a bug, right? I'm not yeah. sure how you would describe that exactly. Well, so. and you'd get the, yeah, come on. No, <laughs> that, that works fine. Exactly. Or, or it works the, on the, my uh, machine. Yeah, or the obvious, OK, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that happens. So at this point, what I'd like to do is we can bounce back out into the, um, uh, the slides here and show kind of where we're at. This virtuous cycle. This constant flow of feedback, constant flow of this collaborative, agile kind of feedback going through the whole cycle is what we're, we're really trying to emphasize here with you and showing you all the, the tooling that we've kind of put along this cycle as you go through this. We're just building on what we've been doing since 2005 um, and just making it just either better in some cases, like you saw the provisional tab, uh, the, the diffing, in, inline diffing, et cetera, um, and then adding Great new, great new capabilities. If you can take us to, back to the, the, the deck there, that'd be great. Um, so I want to make sure that we summarize this uh, appropriately for you, and then we'll be able to take some questions. I believe we'll have enough time. Um, this is the, the, the summary here, the actionable in incident. We showed you that's the IntelliTrace in production. I really hope you take advantage of that, because I think it's going to save you a lot of time. Managing the backlog, the storyboarding assistant that we built on top of product, uh, on top of uh, PowerPoint um, is going to really help you have a high fidelity conversation with your stakeholders. Uh, sprint planning, uh, you, we showed you all kinds of sprint planning tooling that we're, that we're giving you, from the ability to see real time velocity, uh, burn down, and, and trending over time with your sprint backlogs. I think you're really going to enjoy that. All the way down into when you're writing the code. Sprint execution the code reviews, the code clone analysis, um, the my work and the, and the hub are going to be uh, great additions to your workflow, is my anticipation. And then, of course, the continuous stakeholder feedback, which Brian just finished showing you. Again, targeted at having a really rich, rich conversation with your stakeholders. So with that, um, I've got one call to action here. Um, because you know, we're not ready to ship this yet. And so what, what I want you to do is, first of all, come up to speed on Visual Studio 2010, because a lot of the features that we're showing you here is just building on that base, of course. Renew up your, your sub MSDN subscription, because if you do, you'll get all these new bits um, when it's available. Download that System Center CTP that you saw in the keynote. That will connect that product back, the, the production level stuff, and get that back into your, um, uh, your TFS backend and have a, a, high, um, a high bandwidth conversation there. Uh, Jason Zander has published the white paper that you can also get at the, uh, at the booth. Um, in the exhibit hall, but he's also put that on his blog, so check that out. And if you want to stay informed on the features that are coming in vNext, um, we're going to have a, a, you know, a slow cascading rollout on these blogs, Jason Zander's blog, uh, Brian Harry's, and my blog, Cameron Skinner. Um, with that, um, I don't want you to miss a couple, a couple um, Presentations. Terry Leeper uh, from the Visual Studio C++ team is going to be giving a, a talk about ALM for C++ and talking about all of the ALM features that, that we're putting into the C++ side of the house to support native code in a much more fundamental way. And then Brian Keller is doing a manual testing talk uh, with, uh, about Visual Studio 2010. And he'll also, I think you're going to have a little time to show the, the exploratory testing. Right, I'll show testing the new tool. exploratory testing experience that you'll get in the next version of MTM. OK, yeah. that's great. So with that, folks, I really appreciate you coming. Have a great tech ed. And uh, at this point, we can take some questions if you, if you would like. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Go ahead. Let me. There you go. The stakeholder tool as yeah. the recording of actions. We've seen demos with web apps. Will that work with the WPF Silverlight app? 
Yeah. Yeah, so that'll work. Uh, it, it does depend on the type of application you're using. If you take a look at our support for test automation today in 2010, it's the same application matrix. So WPF, Windows Forms, web applications, whether you're using uh, web applications that do JavaScript, it doesn't matter. That'll capture everything there. Yep. Thanks for that. Go ahead. Yeah, I had a quick question. You were showing uh, a little bit about uh, code review. Yeah. Uh, part of our challenge is with respect to context. Is there some way of uh, looking at code review and collaborating be before you submit into the archive uh, just the entire solution? So you're, you're, you want the, essentially all the conversation that's going on around the code review? or uh, What I was looking for is not only just the file that was modified, but the entire solution so that I could look at the context ah. of that change. Okay, so it's, it's part of a, uh, the, the change set. So as you're making changes, right, you're going to see a change set associated with, with the files that you're with, changing. With a file, I'd like to see but, the, the entire context of the entire solution. Sure. Is there you a can, way of doing that? The way, the way TFS works, you can just unshelve that workspace into your local workspace in line with the rest of the solution. So yes, you could F5 that, run unit tests, any of that, absolutely. Okay, so how, did, how is that done? As the originator, you, you, you pull down the entire shelf of, of all the files, or...? or related solution, or how, do you, how would you do that? It's the same way you work with shelf sets today. Uh, maybe if you come see us in the booth, I can show you how that okay, works. Thanks. Great, great, great question. Is that working? Is there a mic down here? Let's try tapping Tap it. Reboot. That, there you go, that's on. Go. Hi, yeah, I was just wondering if you guys are working on tools or, or best practices to help uh, ease of adoption, because my, my team adopted TFS maybe about eight months ago, and we kind of eased our way into it. So first for builds, then for uh, source control, and then for work item tracking. And we've been this octopus spread across <laughs> sure. multiple places, and we're coming home to TFS, and I'm wondering if you guys are working on kind of tools to help, help, help that, because going with like a greenfield solution, brand new project, I can see this being fantastic, but for brownfield existing legacy solutions. Sure. So when you're moving, you're, so you're moving from something to, to team TFS, and you're you're just looking for more guidance or to, or specific tooling. Can you tell them, say a little more? Yeah, I mean, well, if our, our bug system was a fog was fog bugs, kind of like a, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, bringing that underneath TFS I see. and yeah. was SVN now guiding that and just we absorbing these other uh, databases, basically. Yeah, yeah. we have we have a team found a team foundation server integration platform, which is meant to be extensible and is meant to help you push and pull data from all these different solutions. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does require sometimes that you write custom adapters, depending on which other third party or custom solution you're working with. Mm -hmm. If you come see us in the booth, we can have a great con conversation around your specific scenario. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I do know that they need to cut, the, cut loose with the camera soon, so whenever you need to go is cool with us. We'll just keep yeah. taking questions. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, using the uh, code metrics to power tool you put together. Oh yeah. Um, I'm just watching stuff in the keynote. It seemed like there's a great chance to have that integrated with sort of business intelligence for metrics. Um, yes. Is there anything coming, or do we have to build it ourselves for now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, having the, you're 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 talking about a um, a mere's, um, you know all those analytics. You can think of the like code complexity over time yep. kind of thing. Yep. Um, we don't have anything uh, coming so we're right now. We're just using reporting services at the moment. Yeah. We've kind of hacked something together with the XML files that the power tool creates. Yes. But rather than go too far down that path, yeah. if it's going to come, we might as well just it, get yeah, started. I would say, yeah, we don't have anything coming in, in VNEX around this particular feature set. It's something that we're definitely looking at. Trending information uh, is something that we want to really start to take a heavy look at, but, but nothing coming for this. Okay. And just relating to the code review stuff, uh, would you get a sense of the uh, coverage change required in your check-in. So you did the code review, mm. oh look, you've changed this uh, mm. regex, but what about the test coverage that relates to that? Sure, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, actually. Uh, so is the question on your unit test, how you get code coverage, uh, or? No. So in your, in your, when you did your check-in review uh -huh. earlier, you had, okay, so here's my code change, but yeah. what, what's the associated test coverage change with that code change? Yeah. Oh, I, I, wanna, I wanna check in a whole sure. set of changes. That's a great, it's, a great, it's a great suggestion. I, yeah. I don't know the answer to that. We should we should circle back and maybe hit the booth, and we'll circle back sure, on that because that, sure. that's a great one. Yep. All right. Thanks. That's a great one. Back here. Hi. Um, 
in one of the code changes you were making, you made the change from zip to postal code. Yeah. Now, I noticed that you checked the code in. So when you check the code in, do you lose those comments for Rev2? Uh, no, no. So those, cons those, those comments are saved in the um, uh, a change set, essentially. And so you, you actually, they're, they're there as long as you, you know, don't go delete change sets, et cetera. Okay. So they, they do stay with the code. Great. Thank you. Yep. Question. Uh, in Teletrace, when would, when would I be able to deploy to production and start capturing uh, production issues? Was it? When we ship the next. Okay. Yep. And is the technology behind every code, is it similar to IntelliTrace or those are two separate? Uh... Uh, it's, it's two separate things. It's similar. It's using a, a similar mechanism, but, but there, there are two, two collection mechanisms. Right. It's something that we will be working on and making you know, much tighter, much, uh, have a great seamless integration there. Um, and what, what would be the roadmap for now? Just go with system center, uh, AV code, and then down the road, look into IntelliTrace for more yeah, collection I, I, of data? Exactly. So I would say, you know, absolutely go grab uh, the system center stuff mm -hmm. now, um, because the, the Avicode stuff is a monitoring solution. It's always on, right? And so it's gathering different data than what we're able to gather with IntelliTrace, especially if you turn IntelliTrace to high. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, you know, uh, keep the Avocode stuff going, and you're going to find an issue that it just isn't giving you enough information, mm -hmm. and that's when you turn yeah, IntelliTrace up, get that in production, get that trace back. Yes, appreciate it. Yep. I, I also had questions about the uh, IntelliTrace stuff. Is there any kind of configuration to manage, like, the file size of the log file? So Absolutely. That, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it actually, you can set a file size, and then that's actually a, a rolling file size, so you can say, cap this at two gigs, and then it just keeps, yes. <laughs> <laughs> The, and, um, and also, is, is it something designed that you could leave on, or is it you really kind of turn it on when you really need that detail? Yeah, there's two settings to, to IntelliTrace. There's like a low setting where it's gathering events, like uh, he showed you where you're getting um, ASP.NET get events and things of this nature. And then there's a higher uh, value setting where we're gathering like call stack information and real deep parameter information. And that is, we're gathering a, a lot more information there. Um, so it depends on, on, on what you're doing. But I would suggest that you basically, you know, you get it in production, it's really designed to, you have a problem, you see it reproduce, turn on IntelliTrace even at high mode, take a little perf hit there while, it, while it's you know, gathering that data, but get it to reproduce so you get this very rich file coming back. That's kind of how we you, you well, go about it. Well, when you were doing your demo, it, you know, when you first you in, configure that and turn it on and turn the application on, you get that first time hit. Yeah. But what kind of hit do you get while it's running in high mode? Yeah, so we're still trying to figure out what the number is. It's, it's ranging, you know, depending on your app and depending on how much load you're putting on it, we, we don't have an exact number, but you're going to definitely feel it. You know, it's going to be certainly more than 10%, like call it 20, 10 to something. We, we're, we're, we're still in the middle of working this out, right? Still working on the perf. We want to make it as, you know, we don't want to impact you as much as, um, uh, or impact you as little as possible is the design goal. You know, but we are gathering, especially if you turn that up to high, we are gathering deep information. And it's, it's the tough information. You know, it's, it's the information that you would not able, not able to get any, any other way. So right. there's some give and take that, that you're going to have to play here. All right, well, thank you. Excellent yeah. feature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with the IntelliTrace uh, in production, is, is there any way that you can use that for those issues that, that aren't easily reproducible, that are only intermittent and only happen to two users in one branch? Or... Yeah. So uh, it's possible. It's possible. But it's, it's one of those things that you'd want to leave that on. And, and it depends on the setting that you'd want to do. Like I was saying there, there's some give and take that you're going to have to have there. Because there is a, you know, there's going to have a perf hit if you turn that thing up way high to gather lots of information. And and depending on how much data you're gathering, are you going to take a, a perfect every time the application starts up? Only, only the first time it starts up as it rejets everything. Okay. Yeah. And is that, like, we use a lot of terminal server farms where we'll have 100 users. Is each user going to take that hit? No. No. Okay. It's, just, it's just the managed code that's getting rewritten there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we switched from VSS to TFS for source control a couple of years ago. Great. Thank you. And there's still some features in, that VSS has that we're missing in TFS and just wondered, are they, are they ever going to be addressed? What, uh, what? For, sharing files is one. Having the file date on disk be the file date, the original file date, rather than the time that you got the file. I mean, you got some old ancient file that hasn't sure. changed. 
but it's got today's date because you just, you just got it. Sure. Stuff like that. Sure. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, uh -huh. um, but we can take those questions down and, and um, we watch do, their vlogs. Yeah, we do have a, a TFS booth with some experts from the product team. A few of those are actually design reasons, the reasons that we chose to go with, with the, 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 the changes you mentioned as opposed to the old BSS style. Uh -huh. um, and, and I would suggest having a conversation with them to, to really understand the ins and outs and some of, the, some of the problems people got into with the old source safe style. So that's why we went with the TFS style. So we'd love to have that conversation offline. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. With uh, Intel Trace in production, is it going to be possible for us to say blacklist certain variables and certain things or scrub a file, for example, when dealing with uh, PII? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any way for us to scrub that file from production and now uh, increase the chance that the business will adopt this technology if they know they're not leaking PII yeah, yeah, yeah. as part of the trace? Well, the only so we don't have any specific features like that. Um, you, the, the best thing we can do is if, you, if there are modules that you know has sensitive information, you can, you can exclude those particular modules and not um, instrument them. Um, but we don't have a, hey, you know, uh, do, a, do a scrub of the file feature in there. So that would be one of the things that, you know, you, you'd have to have some IT folks would, would need to go and take a good look at that. Um, but that's something we've definitely heard about. Okay. Thanks for that. Say again? So the question was, can you do that with, with attributes? And unfortunately, no, because we, we, we've only got the exclude at the module level right now. So Potentially in the future, sure. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely something we've heard yeah. and we'd like to do. It's just, that's a big, long, slippery slope, you know. Um, so at this point, we'd say, if you're worried about it, then, you know, take those logs and analyze those logs behind the firewall or whomever is, has access to that information, you know, um, yeah. or just exclude those modules. There you go. My question is related to Intel Trace usage. How do you see it in the future as a, as a replacement for custom logging or just to help in production debugging? Uh, we would love it to, to replace uh, logging in general because you don't have to go and, and change your code at all, right? Uh, so, sorry? Everybody hates custom logging. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? And we spend a lot of time instrumenting, manually instrumenting your code with, with yes. these various logging tools. Um, we're not there yet, but, but you can imagine that we could get there with, with this technology because it's essentially doing exactly that. It's instrumenting your code, putting entries and exits in these methods and at parameter levels, and you know, we just yes. need to get there. Yes, but uh, debugging production is good enough. Yeah. Reason to use it. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, any more questions? Okay. All right. Thanks all, Thank folks. Thank you.